let us get started. Our fifth episode of Resident Skeptics. Ooh. We made it a month. Yeah, a little bit over a month now. So five, five yeah. weeks. Five weeks. I think we started end of September. So yeah, this isn't. It's not. We're not doing too bad, right? Not too bad. We haven't missed a week. We've been consistent. We have been consistent. Although I did when we first launched the podcast, I did say we were going to do it on Monday and release it on Monday. It's not Monday anymore, guys. It's Tuesday. It's usually so Tuesday. We just can't manage to get it out on Monday. No, if it's things, Connor's fault. If things go wrong for me on work on Mondays, um, nothing productive happens outside of work on those days, unfortunately. Yeah. So it is. Uh, it is Connor's fault, and so for that. I deeply, deeply apologize. But don't worry. Tuesday's better anyway, because Monday's always horrible, and we always bring horrible news. <laughs> so we'll, It's true. Uh, it gives everybody something to look forward to the next day after a bad Monday. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but first, I just want to start off saying, Connor, how are you doing? I'm tired, but I am doing good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I just wanted to add a slight personal touch. Now that we've done that, let's get into the, <laughs> let's get into the news. I just want to pretend like I care for at least... Half a second um, before we get into all the fun stuff. I think it's, it's mean, okay, it's not great. I'm going to be honest. It's not great. But we do have more fun things planned than just news. We're going to cover other stuff. We do have some, we do have at least one good, one good note to add on, end on at the end of this. Oh, we do. I don't, I'm, I not remember. So surprise me at the end. I don't remember what it is. Okay. All right. Okay. So I feel like a lot's going on. A lot has happened this week like smaller things i feel like if that makes sense yeah like the last two weeks have been breaking news on leaks and really big events uh at the border and stuff so it's it's kind of tamed down a bit but there it's just it's been a lot of news trickling in yeah it's just been kind of i don't know it hasn't been slow it's just been adding on to the big story if that makes sense yeah maybe maybe continuous follow-ups right and Bad follow-ups, bad reasoning. Um, speaking of bad, Joe Biden, <laughs> um, he did do a town hall. I want to say, was it Thursday or Friday that he did that? Mm, I could not tell you. I did not watch it. I didn't watch it either. And typically I would watch it, guys. I would watch it. Um, but I had a very, very busy weekend, so I didn't get a chance to watch it. Um, but basically, Biden a was asked some questions about... The border looks like it was Friday. Friday, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's that's definitely why I didn't <laughs> I didn't see all of it. Um, but yeah, uh, we have a border situation. If you didn't know, right? We have a border problem. Um, I'm actually looking at a New York Times article that is saying that we have had a record uh, quote 1.7 million migrants from all around the world, many of them fleeing pandemic ravaged countries were encountered trying to enter the United States legally, illegally in the last 12 months, capping a year of chaos at the southern border, which has emerged as one of the most formidable challenges for the Biden administration. And this is according to the New York Post. This uh, article was October 22nd, so this was two days ago. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember my days. That's how bad. That's how <laughs> bad my life is getting. Um, it's not that bad. I'm blessed. Um, it was the highest number of illegal crossings recorded since at least 1960. So that's about about 60 years ago. This yep. is the highest this is the highest record. I was going to say 50 years ago and then just remember that it's not the 2000s. Right. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, so this is this is pretty incredible. So you you think about this, all right? So whether you liked Trump or not, listen, we had a pretty good border at that point. We had the Remain in Mexico policy. They'd send them back instead of having uh, people come in and then try to get them for their court dates and trying to keep track of them. It wasn't working out. Um, it was going well. It was going pretty well um, comparatively to what we have now, which is Joe Biden just kind of screwing it up and taking away that policy, which uh, I did hear reports that in November he plans to bring back the policy. I don't know why he doesn't plan on bringing it back right now, mm -hmm. this very moment, um, because this has... Think about it, guys. This has been October, so this has been about 10 months. Uh, 10 months of this uh, crazy border situation, uh, and we need we need to put some stuff in place. But you'd think, 
you think that with a crisis like this, right? You know, if so, Connor, if you have a problem at work, okay, mm-hmm. and you make a mistake, and and it, it's a big screw up, the first thing you probably do is you call, you get over there immediately, you go in there and try to fix the problem, right? exactly, or get people on it that can take care of it but quick, quick, quicker and better than I can. Right, right, and so you'd assume on a larger scale like this, where we have record 1.7 million migrants, that's a lot of migrants. A lot, and this is, as far as I know, it's it's illegal. Do they mention migrants. records? Like, is that setting, that's, I mean, obviously that set the record, but what is that in comparison to Trump, Obama, Bush, the, the following, the previous three that we can remember in our lifetime? Um, there's, there is actually a chart right here that I am looking at, um, mm-hmm. but it is the tiniest text on the planet. Um... Let's see here. I think, so for 2020, it's about 400,000. This is the Southwest border. Uh, for 2019, we have about 850,000. 2017, 300,000. And 2016, another 400,000. So it keeps increasing. Um, no. So 2016, at the Southwest border, it's 400,000. The next year, it's about three hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Next year is about four hundred thousand. Two thousand nineteen is about eight hundred fifty thousand. Then it goes back down. Wow, it doubled. To four, but it goes back down to four hundred thousand. I wonder what causes that. Well, I have no idea. I mean, that's uh, you said. Two thousand nineteen was the the eight hundred thousand plus, right? Eight hundred fifty. Yeah. So then 2020, during the pandemic, it got cut in half. I mean, there's probably reasonable for why that number went down, but I mean, it seems like it's pretty in sync with the up and down numbers. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we did in 2000, let's see, 2006, it looks like there's about a million. Um, 2005, another million. So actually, when we look at some of these numbers, as we keep going, uh, we keep going down, Um it looks like, hang on, why is it saying this is interesting? Hang on. I'm looking down here, it's saying 19, in 1960, it's saying only 21,000? Hang on. Am I not counting it right? It was the highest number of illegal crossings recorded since at least 1960, when the government first began tracking the entries. Mm, okay. So we look at the so they didn't start tracking it until around then, um, and then we're looking at two thousand. So I'm gonna go to the two thousands, and so the highest, one of the highest, the second highest was in two thousand, um, which was one point six million, and this is according to um, the chart here by the United States Border Control. So that's kind of where we're that's kind of where we're at. That's the highest, I believe, the second highest. And there's a couple of years that kind of follow it. There's 1986. And let's see, that might be that might be like one of the closest. And then 1990, uh, 1999. 1999 is pretty close as well. So you can take a look at it uh, for yourself. But from all the numbers here, um, like I'm looking at all the numbers and looking at the millions here. 1.7 is the highest because we have a lot of these years tied for like maybe 1.5 million, uh, 1.6 million, 1.2 and 1.3 million. Uh, but this is the highest one. This is the highest, and this is during Biden's open border policy. Yes, uh, which I believe he's reinstating the uh, the stay in Mexico policy now. Yes, yes, that's why I said so for November. He's going to reinstate it. And I don't know why, again, I don't know why he's not doing it sooner. But if we look at the Trump era, so we have 2020, we have all of these numbers, 400,000. 2016 to 2020? Yeah. And so Biden's only been in office for 10 months. Mm-hmm. 1.7 million. Insane. That's absolutely insane. Trump, I mean, he's definitely over that that 1.7 million, but over a course of- For his entire four, four years, isn't right. it? Right. Which is a which is a big difference compared to. Did, did they list the number on that article for Trump's four years? Let me see if they do. Keep keep going. I'll look for that and see if I can find it. Yeah. Uh, so so basically, 
Biden is is asked is like, so we just talked about okay, Connor, if you make a mistake, you go over there and you fix it. Mm-hmm. So, um, if anyone's been paying attention, Biden hasn't been going. Kamala Harris went like five hundred miles away from the border and then said that she went to the border, uh, which I don't know that that seems a little that seems a little silly to me. I don't think that I don't think that counts. Um, but uh, Joe Biden did say that he was like oh i've been to the border i've i've been to the border um 10 years ago really y- yeah he really went for that one. yeah well here's what so saki jen saki always has to clean up after joe biden because yes we've always- discussed it before she has one of the most difficult jobs in the country currently it is the most difficult it's the most difficult job it must be just the most frustrating and she always sounds she sounds very, very, quite frankly, stupid um, because she can't cover up these lies. Like, it's just almost mm-hmm. impossible. So uh, Saki is in the White House boardroom and the dopest, coolest, awesomest reporter in the world, Peter Ducey. I think he should be president next. That, that's just my opinion. I think he should be president because he's that cool. Um, he's the only one in the White House press room that actually asks good questions, like, no one else asks any good questions. They're all just these softball. What kind of a, uh, ice cream does does Biden like? And it's like, <laughs> um, I don't care. That's my favorite question for any president. How many scoops did you have? What's your favorite flavor? I just we don't care. I just don't care. Like he's caused so many issues at this point. I don't care. Um, but anyway, um, according to a Daily Wire article, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki defended President Joe Biden on Friday over Biden's claim during a CNN town hall on Thursday night. So it was Thursday night, not Friday. Ah, okay, Thursday night. And that the article you must have looked at, they must have written it. Most of the the ones that I was looking at were published on Friday. Right, so it made sense that it would be uh, Thursday night, uh, that he had visited the border before. So here's what the transcript says. (laughs) Peter Ducey, following up on something else the president said last night, why did President Biden say he had been to the border? And here is Saki's response. Um, Well, Peter, as you may have seen, there's been reporting that he did drive through the border when he was on the campaign trail in 2008. Oh, congratulations. That is. Wow. Okay. Okay. Okay, Saki. And I'm going to continue to quote her. And he certainly, and he is certainly familiar with the fact, and it stuck with him, with the fact that in El Paso, The border goes right through the center of the town. But what the most important thing everyone should know and understand is that the president has worked on these issues throughout his entire career, as well-versed in every aspect of our immigration system, including the border. That includes when he was vice president, and he went to Mexico and Central America 10 times to address border issues and talk about what we can do to reduce the number of migrants who are coming to the border. And she continues on. This is a direct transcript from the White House um Connor, what the heck? <laughs> what and I... and and it says and then she suggested that the border crisis was probably the fault of the previous administration, which doesn't make any sense if they're about to reenact the previous administration's well policy. Well, that... remember they called the policy racist. Yes, they did. This is see. This is what happened. Everybody, Joe Biden's racist. We oh know it. Uh, it. It's so frustrating. Because everything that Democrats don't like is racist, and they've just removed the term of meaning. Of meaning, you and I have talked about this before. Um, I don't know that it's fair to say Democrats at this point, because that party is multiple things. I think I would say leftists. I'm going to go leftists. On leftists, it. progressives. Yeah, leftists. Definitely, uh, definitely on the progressive side of things. I, I, yeah. I want to be a little bit. I want to be a little bit more careful with those terms because we do have our classical liberals who would disagree with the progressives and we're seeing people uh like that come out now well you heard that joe manchin is is considering leaving the democratic party to become an independent yes yes i did hear that because his party is just that insane it's no longer i feel like the democratic party i feel like mm-hmm. it's the party of of leftists and and, and socialists and, and you have bill Maher saying he's like i'm actually playing to conservative audiences now and it, like he's he has mixed yeah. audiences and he's like surprised but he's finding that the 
the content that they seem to want is to just make fun of wokeness at this point because it's just it's gone that absurd because it's so because it's so stupid at this point it's it's almost nonsensical and i said i wasn't going to be like too mean but there got, there has to be a point where someone looks at all of this and looks at all the things that people get offended by and that no one can take a joke anymore we have to have perfectly uh politically correct language that is as vague as ever mm -hmm. to describe specific things or nuanced right extremely nuanced i think extremely we're at nuanced. 76 different genders and counting including some that just basically mean you however you feel yeah it's a it's a big it's a big problem it's a big problem and also i think what's happening is that these things that people get offended by i think it's very small amounts of people that kind of and i hate to say it like this but throw a tantrum Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of bowing our knee to a very small, a very small group. And if we create, and here's the issue, I feel like it's going to multiply. The more we continue to create victim groups, the smaller those, those, the smaller those groups become, and then they all start shouting together. And so there's a lot of appeal to being victimized in this culture. Um, if you're a specific ethnicity, you get a lot of attention. You do. If you're a certain sexuality, you get attention, um, and and this is appealing to I think even a younger audience. Uh, I'd say, uh, you know, young adults uh, to you know teenagers to to children that want to feel well, accepted. And, and yeah, and you're, you're talking about an entire generation, a couple of generations now uh, that have grown up with social media and get that dopamine rush every time they get a like or they get another follow, and that's what they push for. And there's reports coming out that social media especially new ones, especially dating sites, they will just flood your inbox with fake people just to give you that high and get you hooked and get you keep going. Uh, mm, there's an interview with Dr. Uh, Jordan Peterson with a gentleman who was privy to some of this information. He wouldn't say which particular dating app it was, but that it was pretty common for guys when they get on a dating app that they will match with a really gorgeous woman relatively quickly because it gives them that 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 quick rush of there might be somebody for you. You might be able to look, you are attractive. Here is somebody, but it's a fake account. Hmm. And they'll, they'll even have the fake accounts talking with them for a little bit, just to kind of get them started up. And then they just ghost them. But now that, now that guy's hooked. Actually, that, that'd make my self esteem drop. If that were me, I'd be like, Oh, this is kind of sad. I, that's, that it's going to be the different way that men and women work. And so, I, I and online dating is way more potent for guys and they're way less likely to get picked by a girl on social media Yeah. or on a, or on a dating app. And that just, we were talking about it earlier before the podcast that TikTok is just. It's trash. I, I consider it full blown trash. It is where uh, your intellect goes to die. Yes. And Whether you're watching or creating content. Yeah. I'm I'm just being very honest. I have spoken out pretty um loudly to uh my my own uh my own groups of, of people and uh, even students of being like just get off of this garbage time sucking mm -hmm. app that is going to kill your brain cells. And I've been kind of been convicted of this myself. Like it like I don't have TikTok on my phone because I believe it's a Chinese communist app that's garbage, so I don't have it on there. That's a Jordan opinion for you. Can't I think it's verifiable, but uh, I, it's it a does. Jordan it opinion. does. It does have links to China. I believe it is actually owned by a Chinese company. Yeah, and, and I think Chinese are just like, oh, let's just make Americans dumb. Let's just make the new generation Americans dumb. This working. Is, yeah, no, it's totally it's totally working. Um, because this the stuff I see on there is is just garbage. But I even think about like Instagram and Facebook. And they, they all have their short form video factors now. YouTube has YouTube shorts. Because they're trying to compete with each other. Yes, they're all competing with each other. Right. But it is like a total time suck. Um, so I kind of made a shift probably, I think, even since we started this podcast of even I was on my way here. Because mm -hmm. um, if anyone, you guys don't know, Connor and I are about 40 minutes away. Um, so we sacrifice. Oh, I sacrifice for you guys. And I, <laughs> and I drive here. Um <laughs> But I've been listening to like different audio books. I think I'm, mm -hmm. I'm listening to. You can get through a lot of content on drives like that. And I do very well with audio, and I retain it very well, so it works incredibly well for me. I think I'm listening. I'm listening to the Four Loves by C.S. Lewis, mm -hmm. narrated by C.S. Lewis. Oh, um, this is his only audio recording. 
Oh, that's amazing. And he sounds so British and charming. It's adorable. It's <laughs> adorable. Um, and his quotes sound way better in his own voice. The the quote about um, if to love at all is to be vulnerable, you know, put yourself in a casket, you'll be safe, but alone and all mm. that good stuff. He does that one. And right now I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm listening to a book on the history of the Islamic state and what Islamist's goal is for the world. And it's very, very good. Um, mm, okay. So, and, I, and when I started going, my point in saying that is as I started going through these, I was like, wow, I've wasted so much of my time doing nothing and with, and no offense to my friends and even myself, the content that they're creating doesn't even match the richness of the, of the, um, audio that I get to listen to from very good authors, from philosophers, right. uh, theologians, um, all that good stuff. I get a lot more from them as opposed to a long caption. Nothing's wrong with having like a thoughtful post. I'm not saying I that. mean, I guess at least you'd look at your friend's post. I generally don't. I do because I, I care about my friends and I have no issue with them doing that. My point is on my end, if that's the only thing I'm consuming and I'm not able to, if I'm not consuming anything else... Uh, then then that's that's kind of an issue mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah it's it's a, a lot of that stuff is made to be short form factor it's little it's little blips little verbs little uh quotes zingers and there's not really a lot of context or meat behind it and there's just there's not much to retain yeah out of it it's if anything it's a it's a feel good or feel bad moment and you move on to the next video and you just keep going and I've sat there on my phone and I've been there for an hour or two hours at the end of the day. I'm just mm. brain dead. And I'm just constantly scrolling through short Instagram or Facebook videos Is or YouTube. Is that why you just like all my posts at once, Connor? <laughs> I don't like anybody's posts. <laughs> you, like, you like my... I see you pop in there sometimes. I'll, 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 there's very few people I'll go in and check and it's just like, okay, I'll click this one. I think I've got like you and one other person that post stories on the regular that I'll go look at them. And I like some of them and I don't like others. That's fair. If, if it applies to me, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I like it. And if it's like, eh, I don't know what this is, I'm just going to keep going. I did post a picture of a friendly shark on my Instagram. Never saw it. What? That was the cutest shark. Okay, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. But yeah, I'm with you where you can you can end up wasting a lot of time. And to a certain extent, it's become, well, tell me what you think. To a certain extent, it's become kind of socially acceptable to do that, if you know what I'm saying. To do what? Sit on... Yeah. Set on your phone and just go through videos. Yeah. It's what entirely you... socially acceptable. And we, I mean, we do it too. I mean. Yeah, we, we do it too. I definitely try to not do it when I'm with people. Yeah. Um, but then I have people like my wife who is, a, seems to be at least a little bit ADD and she can sit there and she's got to be fidgeting with something or else her thoughts just leave the conversation. So she's sitting there fidgeting, whether it's like with a, a little mobile app game or she's drawing or she's, she's got to be doing something else. Otherwise, her mind just leaves the conversation entirely. And I've tested her on just stop the conversation cold with somebody and then just turn around and ask her, what were we just talking about? What did, what did I say about this? What was his last comment? And she'll, repi or she'll repeat all of it. But if she's not doing that, if I make her put the phone down and then we're going through a conversation and then I it and she's just like, what? <laughs> what? What did you say? <laughs> she totally missed it. I'm sorry. Um, but to bring it back, how, how do we deal with an entire party that claims... Claims one thing, such as in this sense that the stay in Mexico policy was racist or that voter ID is racist. Mm -hmm. And then within not even a year at this point, because Trump left office beginning of February, he's gone. We're yeah. here in the end of October, and now they are reinstating the stay in Mexico policy. And states are calling for voter ID laws unanimously across the board. And somehow that is not racist. Yeah, I think you, you, you've you brought up a good point. I think it comes back to something important. They don't actually care, and I'm going to explain that. This is just, we know that it is, it's virtue signaling. Anything that makes them look good but doesn't actually have any substance to it. Mm -hmm. So if for the moment it sounds, if it makes people happy to say that Trump is racist for having this policy, they'll do it. And it, honestly, it wouldn't have just been Trump. It would have been any Republican. I guarantee it. I guarantee because they, they've smeared other Republicans before and that will just happen. But it's all about virtue signaling. Well, and we've seen them smear Democrats that decide that they're not going to go along with the Democratic narrative. Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema are perfect examples of people they are willing to smear and bully to get their way. Mm -hmm. they, they don't care about people. They care about power. Like we look at this 
situation, right? With the with the border. <sighs> well, and who yeah. was it? Who was it that uh, ran for governor? Just ran against Newsom for governor of California. Larry Elder. Larry Elder, and New York Times called him the blackface of uh, what did they? What was that New York Times article? I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I don't. I know they're trying to say like the blackface of white supremacy. Yes, that was it. Um, and it's. And I know the, this word has lost its meaning, but in this case, that is truly a racist and vicious thing to say. And these are the people that are standing for love and empathy. And the truth is... Tolerance and acceptance, yeah. Yes, and, but the truth is they want, you, they want you to be black and they want you to believe a certain thing. If you don't believe that certain thing, you're not accepted. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's the issue. That Larry Elder is... If you've ever heard him speak before, I've listened to his stuff uh, just boy the man can talk and man he has statistics off the top of his head uh just truly incredible this is a smart intelligent man that says no i'm not gonna think like that because i know the truth i know and i can prove that you're wrong and he and he does so there's a great interview um with dave rubin who now has moved uh to the conservative side he used to call himself Mm. a classical liberal at this point i think he's pretty much conservative um where he was kind of he was saying yeah systemic racism exists and Larry Elder Larry Elder stopped him and said name something I remember this and this was a viral moment because Dave tried to and every time he tried to bring something up Larry would say well this statistic and this thing and this thing that's not true name another one or something something along those lines yeah, he, he just, just got him to keep refuting. going keep going yeah um, if I remember that conversation correctly it basically made Dave Rubin look like a fool because he 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 just had these talking points. But it had no substance. And that's what we have here is they have a talking point that's it's like, oh, it's racist. And the reason, and by the way, and the reason why they want the border to be open is so that they have more voters that will vote Democratic. Um, that is the main reason. Because why else would you not allow uh, Cuban refugees to come in? Mm-hmm. Um, because Cuban refugees know what socialism is. And so they're like, actually, no, we're not going to vote for Democrats. We don't want this again. Why do you think Florida uh, went mostly to Trump? It's because you have a bunch of people who have come from a socialist area and know what it's like and say, uh, I don't think so. Don't want it. Yep, I don't want it. And that's why they're doing what they're doing. And that's the thing, they don't care. And this is when I say they don't care. Here's the thing. Oh man, this this gets me worked up because people, there are some people, and there's been a debate about this with illegal immigration, that if you're against illegal immigration, you don't care. You, why wouldn't you want them to come to America? These are the same people that think America is racist too, but I digress. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, come, let them come to America. And they, it's oversimplified. I feel like I feel like sometimes when people are super empathetic with real no logic or facts attached to it, it's almost, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's almost oversimplified. Um, it doesn't have that substance to it where I'm like, okay, you care about people. You're empathetic. I'm with you there. I'm empathetic too. And I'm empathetic as well, knowing that this is a huge way to do, um, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So think about the increase of all these children. And, and I've, uh, I watched an interview with uh, Tim Ballard for, um, I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, the Nazarene Project and also the Underground Railroad, where he does uh, specific work with sex trafficking and trying to get them out. I believe he's Mormon, if I remember correctly, uh, but he also works with Glenn Beck as well. Okay. So, if that helps reference you, I know you know who Glenn Beck is. Mm-hmm. But he basically talks about, you know, what they're now starting to do is these traffickers are taking in these kids and saying that they're a family unit and they're trafficking these kids, getting them in. So it's not it's not compassionate at all to open the boards. Like this is the best thing. It's not, it's not because we have more kids that are going to get trafficked in there. Probably more sex trafficking, human trafficking, all those things that aren't very good for our country at all. Also, we have drug trafficking. (laughs) We have a lot of different stuff going on at this border that if we actually have these people remain in Mexico, we could have a better outcome uh, for them. And then also for our country as Mm -hmm. well. So those are I, I went on a monologue there. That's all right. I mean, and that being said, uh, where they need to they need to fix their their border policies. But I think I think the immigration system also needs a complete overhauling. It, it shouldn't take you know a mom and you know and her kids years to to get through uh, the the entire process from everybody that I talk to that has any semblance of what's going on in there is that it it's a mess. Yeah. And you know I. 
I want those people to be able to get a chance at living in America and get a chance at what this country has to offer because it's it is a great country despite the, some of the stuff that we're talking about today that seems to be the negative aspects of it. Um, but overall, I, I would say you know if we have Haitian migrants or you have Puerto Rican migrants mm-hmm. and they want to come over here, they should be able to within a reasonable amount of time. But we should be able to do it through a good process. I totally, I totally agree. Like, if they want, I have no issue with um, immigration. No, I have none. an issue with, I have an issue with illegal immigration because if someone goes through legally, like, there's almost a sense of pride that you go through. As far as I've been able to tell, and and talking to people, and even just what I imagine mm-hmm. of becoming a legal citizen, and and wanting to do it right, and then wanting to become an American citizen. Um, I feel like there'd be a great amount of pride in that. But if you're doing it under the radar or you're a criminal, and, and I'm not saying all uh, legal immigrants are criminals. That's not. I mean, and not all I'm. Technically, they are because te- it is yes, illegal. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, but like violent. Dangerous, uh, violent, violent criminals. Dangerous yes. Dangerous criminals. Do I think that there are some that are? Yes. And I just alluded to the fact that I believe that because of human mm. trafficking, uh, sex trafficking and such. Um, I'm trying to remember what I was, gonna, I was saying. Ah, uh, yes, I was talking about doing it legally. If they do it legally, I'm fine with that. If they don't, that's a problem for me. And also... And, and it's a problem because there's dangers that come along as, associated with it, not to mention what it, whatever happens when they get into the States. Like, people just, they, they disappear. And, and, and right. the, you think about kids that get into America and if they disappear. I mean, we don't have any documentation on them. Nope, How are we going to track them? We don't right. have we don't have a picture. We don't have parents. We have nothing on these kids. They're, they somebody kidnaps them. They disappear into any type of circumstance, and we don't really have the means to find them because we don't know they exist. Right. It's this is a scary reality. This is very scary. And you and I, we both care about our children. We care about children of the world. I mean, I do at least. We can't help all of them, and that's and that's something that people do need to consider with um, legal and illegal immigration is that not everyone can migrate to America. We America is not responsible for helping every single person. We can't. It's simply not possible, at least from my point of view. Connor, you might have a different point of view than I do. Uh, no, I would say America can't. I would say the, the church needs to. Yeah, yeah and uh, the that, church that should is, be is part global. Of the church. Yeah, and the church is global. Right. Um. And so we can't help all of them. It's just not it's just not possible. And if you bring in especially illegal immigrants, we don't necessarily know what their moral beliefs are and how they feel about America. And mm-hmm. as much as people hate this, we are founded on a common principle of of freedom. And I don't know if we have a bunch of illegal immigrants coming in to the united states if that's going to start tearing the fabric of society that doesn't mean i'm not saying that anyone who migrates to america uh, can't appreciate freedom i don't think that at all i think that it's just specific if they're coming in illegally what does that mean does that make sense i don't know if i'm making sense i think i think what you're trying to get is that you're more concerned about the culture that they're coming from and if it if it synchronizes with our own culture and we we've seen some of yes, that some I think of the you issue. Put that well. We've seen some of that issue come from uh, Middle Eastern cultures, where the rape culture is is very deep and even somewhat built into the religion, from my understanding. And that does not vibe well when it comes to America, right? Because we are very much against that. Yeah. By and large, we are. We are pretty much against that, and that kind of leads into kind of the next thing that I have. With uh, we have Afghan Afghan uh, refugees coming in. Uh, a new report came out just recently of an Afghan refugees are facing charges. Um, they tried to rape a child and strangle a woman uh, in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, uh, this is uh, disturbing um, to to say the least. And as I was looking into this story. Uh, these are, by the way, this the assault occurred on September 7th, uh, 2021. So this is probably from after uh, whatever happened in Afghanistan. We have mm-hmm. refugees coming in here. There's other stories of um, other other rapes. And Biden, uh, they're saying that they can vet 
these Afghans well. Um, and I think I'm going to say something that's very controversial here. Not all cultures are created equal morally. I no. don't believe that. Um, I'm not saying American culture. I honestly, I don't love American culture right now. I think it's kind of... No, uh, I would. It's American culture is far from, far from moral, but I think the important distinction with American culture, um, at least for those that don't believe that rape culture is something Americans like to do, which seems to be the argument sometimes. Uh, I, I think American culture is very much against it, uh, but it does seem that there's a, a victim culture that gets ignored or shot down like we covered last week with Loudoun County. Um, but I would say the American culture is very much more, it's limited to a person's self that they have the freedom to do whatever they want with their body. And, that, and, and that's created a lot of interesting avenues of, you know, is it okay for that person to to treat themselves like this or adorn their body in such a way with all these tattoos and, and, and piercings or or doing these drugs or living this type of lifestyle? And you know what? It's it's their life and they have the choice to make that. The problem with a culture like this from the Middle East is that this type of culture affects other people. Well, I mean, I can't speak to these the, the two uh, rapists' um, religion at all. Uh, but even, again, listening to a lot of stuff about what goes on, at least for extremists, uh, Islamist extremists, I don't know about Muslims themselves, but they, it's both political and religious. They want a reformation of society mm-hmm. um, to do one thing. And for Islamist extremists, um, that means jihad uh, for, for anyone that, that doesn't comply, even their own... Uh, even their own Muslim uh, brothers and sisters that they don't think are complying uh, correctly. Right. So it's it's very uh, it's very violent uh, to say the least. <laughs> um, that we could have a whole we could have a whole discussion on that. It's pretty it's pretty uh, it's pretty uh, sombering. I think is the word I'm looking for. I would I would very, agree. Sombering is the right word for that. Where it's just when you realize you know people are so worried about Christian nationalism, and as I've been you know, digging into the history of the Islamic State, I've been like, um, there's actually a much greater threat. I think there's a greater threat happening here. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I'm making, I'm trying to make a separation between Islamic State and, and um, like, Sunni uh, Muslims. Right. Um, which I'd want to make that distinction really, really clear. Hey, guys, this is Connor with a quick correction. Jordan made a distinction between Islamic State and Sunni Muslims when she actually meant radical Islams and peaceful Muslims. Now back to the podcast. Um, but this is this is something that I'm I'm scared about when we bring in refugees, and we're not vetting them, and we're gonna and we're gonna continue to see more stories like this. I think this is one that I found, and there's another one that I found. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm concerned. I'm concerned, and I know that you know there's a lot of people that that need help, and we've talked about trying to get our allies out. Uh, a really good report that came out is that some. Uh, I think it was just veterans uh, from the U.S. Army did a flight and they got like a, like another couple hundred um, of our allies out or refugees out, which was mm-hmm. good and that was that was good to hear. But my concern is with our our vetting process. I'm much I don't know I'm much more concerned about Afghan refugees because even we talked last week about some potential hijackers that were on one right. of those planes. Uh, and they they're just shoveling them in, and and we're not and we're not sure what's going on. So I have some I have some concerns here, for sure. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have, if we have plants that have have made it here to America. And I I am frightened for future attacks. Yeah, no, it's a it's a fair concern when our vetting system seems to be in disarray and then on top of it they just add an open border policy for people to pour in and we've had a and the thing is is that we're saying this knowing that most of the people are going to be good people that just really want to have a better life it's it's the it's the it's the evil intent behind the ones that wish to do people in this country harm uh which includes the illegal immigrants that they're taking advantage of to travel into the country with but I do have a question, though. We obviously have, like, hey, these people are good. These these people are good. You know, these people are bad. What about people, and, and I want to say this the best that I can, what about people where they don't see the value in 
our our freedom in what the constitution is made of not necessarily being bad people or mm-hmm. good people but just not seeing that it's it's valuable and not wanting to protect it the same way that we do like like what about that and that's something that i haven't i don't have like a firm answer on it it's just kind of something i thought about while you were talking i've i've asked myself that question a lot is the people that trash and drag this country and what it stands for and its its founding principles they just drag it through the mud which in doing so is simultaneously taking advantage of the fact that you're not going to get put to death or tortured or taken off to the jail cell because you spoke out against the country and you know in america you're free enough to burn a flag you know burn you can you can burn a flag uh, you've seen people on videos take a take a dump on it just desecrate everything that they can that symbolizes this this country and its principles and it's it's a weird irony to me yeah it's a weird irony because in any other country you would probably there's many other countries out there that you would be shot and what's odd is that the type of country they tend to call for which is more and more government uh oversight is usually the type of countries that result in you not being able to have that type of freedom and i just don't know if they think that far ahead i think they genuinely do see i think once you remove god the next thing you look towards and you remove family so you're not looking up to your family you're Mm -hmm. not looking to god um and that comes in the removing the family part comes with just this the sexual revolution um, you start looking to government and for the life of me, I, I just don't know why I ever would. And you're talking about this whole freedom. Uh, there's a great song called America by Tom McDonald. He's actually a rapper. Um, really? yes, but he has made some killer. He's made like the top charts because his music is so good. He has a song called America. He says, your freedom is the reason you can disrespect the flag. Um, if you want to keep doing it, I'll help you pack your bags and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and get out. Um, it is it is the irony there that is really appalling that they would speak out like that against America, the place that has given them all the freedom to do it and the freedom to pursue almost honestly whatever you want. Mm-hmm. The world is yours here in America, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, for now, Um Obviously, there are moral principles that I subject myself to as a believer in Christ. I'm, I'm better off for it. I'm better off having God as my authority than the government because I found out that man, man is fallible. Yep. Uh, God is And God. government changes too. Government does change and, and government is power hungry because they're not God. But God has all the power. He knows what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to subject myself to him. Um, and it's not as bad as it sounds. It's I'm actually very free. I'm free in Christ and free enough in America. That'll go away eventually, I imagine. Yeah, I, I think this is this one's an, an important one to to hit on here. Between talking about the difference between subject sub, subjugating yourself between God and government is that if your morals are based on the law of the government, those laws can be changed. And if you if your morals change with the laws of the government, then what kind of morals do you actually have? It's a shifting. It's a shifting ground. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, not going to stop changing. It, it depends on the culture. I, I've talked with people before that had issues with, uh, like, how how dare these kids drink alcohol before they're twenty one? And it's like, well, you can have your personal opinion on when they should be able to drink, but here in America, it's twenty one. Uh, you get over to like Germany, and I believe they can drink before sixteen. Oh, really? You, you go to all sorts of different countries and you get different drinking ages all the way down to like age 11. And that, the, that goes for having uh, consent to sex as well. I mean, that differs just in the states in our country. Mm. Where California, it's 18. And here in North Carolina, it's 16. And it's just, it's different. So as you, you can't place your morals on the laws of your government. That That will result in all sorts of changes that you're not going to like down the road. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that. And I would say the biggest the biggest difference with America, at least, and I want to make a difference between like what the founding fathers wanted and what our current government and the legislation that they're trying to pass against mm-hmm. uh, the Constitution. The Constitution 
uh, whether you're, you like it or not, I, I like it. I don't know why people get so upset about it, is that it is based on biblical principle, on the belief that that we're gods first and that we, we should have freedom and liberty. And, of course, a lot of arguments uh, from those that are more on the left and even some who are more right-leaning might be, well, what about slavery? And, of course, that was a that was a big mark on our history. But the document fulfilled itself. The document was meant to stand the test of time, and they did end up fulfilling it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another conversation, which I was actually... I was listening to another thing on uh, <laughs> on Thomas Jefferson and some of the reasons why he chose to do what he did. And people forget about the historical context and kind of the generation that they were in of of how likely it was for them to just abolish slavery like that. You know, there's a lot of really complicated factors that not to excuse action, but to take into consideration as you are forming uh, your opinion on these things, but no doubt that it was wrong and treacherous. Uh, but the Constitution ended up being fulfilled eventually. I think that we were the first to uh, abolish slavery, which was good. We, we consider that good. Um, uh, actually, in the world, we were not the first. I want to say I'm thinking Western. Mm, I don't know when it comes to to Canada and then south of. I'm pretty sure we were first. As far as countries, I believe we were one of the last. Actually, are you sure? Yep. Hang on, I'm pretty. Which Western countries abolished slavery first? I am pretty sure it's America. I, mean, I guess are you talking when you say Western? You're talking just north, south, north and south America. Mm-hmm. That might be possible, but uh, it was it was already being banned, uh, outlawed in Europe and other countries. With, hang on. Well, I say Europe, continents. This Western countries abolish slavery first. Either way, either way, it is, it is, it isn't. I, I think it's an important thing to to look at what our constitution was made for, and that we were able to course correct it. Um. Okay, so it was Haiti. Hang on. That uh, yeah, Haiti then, Haiti doesn't surprise me if they were still and then and then the U.S. So I'm I'm pretty sure it was us. Hang on, which country abolished it last? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty sure we were one of the first. Okay, well we can we can look into up. this. That'll be. Hang on, when did England abolish slavery? No, we were first. Hang on. We were before England. I think so. When did England abolish slavery? That was. The Slavery uh, Abolition Act was 1833. And then when did the U.S. abolish slavery? I wish these dates would stay in my head. Oh, uh, you know what? I was wrong. Well, hang on. Yep, I was wrong. I was pretty sure we were one of the first, but I was wrong. It was 1865 for um, President Abraham Lincoln... He declared all persons held as slaves shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free. And then, hang on, I'm going to look up France, because I feel like France is a good one to to measure up to. Yeah, that'd be another good one. Hang on. Oh! Okay, they did 1794. Wow. So I was completely wrong. (laughs) (laughs) I thought we were the first. I was like, oh yeah, we're the first. And I was like, nope, that was wrong. My apologies. but That's all right. But we still abolished it. <laughs> that's important. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's like it, it, it is it is a blight on our country's history. Guess what? Every other country too. Well, that's that's kind of the point too. Is that every every place here they had to abolish slavery eventually. Yep. Um, so it wasn't just it wasn't just the United States. Um, no, it, many other countries tell. had to, and unfortunately, that you know there is still slavery. We still do have sex slavery, and you were talking about you know the different like child trafficking and stuff. That is a form of slavery. Yep, 100%. and it continues to this day in the United States. It continues in other countries as well. Nobody's free of it, and people we we need to continuously work to to fight against it. And this border stuff that we have going on is certainly it's not helping it it, 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 it well it is helping slave trafficking it's not helping end it no. and 
allowing open borders did did no service to any of the kids that are getting brought over and then dropped off just to get somebody across the border because they they don't get stopped nearly as much from my understanding yeah. and they're, they're less likely they're, they're less likely to get sent back if they've got kids and uh speaking of kids actually at the beginning of this week you sent me over an article and i had seen it that morning as well new york post uh I think they were the initial ones. It might have been. Uh, mm, I don't want to. I don't want to give the credit to the to the wrong one. I think it is the Post. Uh, they found that the Biden administration was chartering plane flights of immigrant children and sending them off to to New York and Florida in the middle of the night. Well, according to Jen Psaki, it was early in the morning, at, uh, <laughs> about two a.m. Red so. eyes are not <laughs> considered <laughs> early morning. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah, so early morning to uh, to night flights. Uh, yeah, they're 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 smuggling them around, or I don't know if smuggles the right. I, word, I mean, here but... we can read some of the article from the New York Post. Uh, this was came out October eighteenth, twenty twenty one. Biden secretly flying underage migrants into New York in dead of night. Plane loads of underage migrants are being flown secretly into suburban New York in an effort by President Biden's administration to quietly resettle them across the region. And the Post has learned. The charter flights originate in Texas, where the ongoing border crisis overwhelmed local immigration officials and have been underway since at least August, according to sources familiar with the matter. Last week, the Post uh, saw two planes land at the Westchester County Airport, where most of the passengers who got off appeared to be children and teens, with a small portion appearing to be men in their 20s. Westchester County cops stood by as the passengers whose flights arrived at 10.49 p.m. Wednesday and 9.52 p.m. Friday got off and piled into buses. Some of them were later seen meeting up with relatives or sponsors in New Jersey or being dropped off at a residential facility on Long Island. An analysis of online flight tracking data suggests that around 2,000 of the underage migrants have arrived at the airport outside White Plains on 21 flights since August 8th. Records show some of the planes touched down between midnight at 6.30 a.m., uh, sorry, midnight and 6.30 a.m. When a voluntary curfew is in effect, with two arriving from Houston at 2.13 a.m. and 4.29 a.m. There's your early morning time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you sent me this article, and I, I caught a listen of it uh, from one of the Timcast ones, and it's like, it sounded familiar to me, and on that one, they reminded that they had actually reported back on this in May. In May, Tennessee lawmakers were fuming after migrants, migrants were reportedly snuck into the state. So they've been doing this for months. And now this is me going to rag on the Republicans here is they tend to just kind of sit on their thumbs when it comes to this stuff. They get enraged and then they don't do anything because it's still going. It's not stopped. And they and, the, and it's been complete just radio silence since May that this has been going on there. And it happens again. Just this last week, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing this." Yeah, there are points where I really wish Republicans would, and at this point, they don't have the power that they that they used to because you know the Democrats barely have the Senate, and then they also have the White House. But whenever they do have power, they don't do anything. I'm just like, why aren't you doing? They just, you they're doing just something? like the biggest and oldest pushovers uh, in generations, and. On top of that, I'm actually fairly ticked off with these cops that just stand by and let these kids get brought in on these midnight flights and well, are not. What, what would you propose that they do, though? Like, what power do they have? I don't know in that case, but they certainly don't have to be there for it. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, that's the thing. Like, you know, when you do things in your job, you're like, I don't agree with this, but I don't have a choice. And I'm not. Trying I mean, to fully I mean, I mean, you're you're, them, you're dealing but... you're dealing with kids that are arriving i mean it sounds like some of them are going to legitimate places uh i don't know what the residential facility is um i know that there were some buses from other reports that they weren't able to follow and they didn't know where they went but the the bus locations included bronx brooklyn queens upstate newborough bridgeport and bridgeport and danbury in connecticut so they're just going all over the place yeah. and do, do we really know where they're going why are they doing it in the middle of the night why are they being so quiet about it it's because because Biden's policies are failing. Like that's why they're if things were going well, they wouldn't be doing it in the middle of the night. All right, they were obviously trying to keep it under wraps. Um, I am kind of surprised that we didn't hear about this sooner because this is the first time it's the first time I've heard of it. 
Um, and I'm trying to even remember what was in the news cycle uh, in May. It's possible it just kind of got thrown away with all the things that Biden was trying to do with COVID, um, with the vaccine. I'm not trying to necessarily make excuses for anyone, but I'm just trying to figure out what happened. I'm not really, I'm not really sure. I think, I think the Republican Party did what they're really good at, which is uh, <laughs> they see something they don't like, and they're like, "Oh, I don't like this." Carry on. What do you, what do you think they should have done? Make a bigger stink about it. I mean, you look at what the Democrats do when they get something that they don't like, and they just don't let it go. We got four years of them just hounding Trump. They didn't like Trump being president. They can't let it go. The Republicans didn't like Biden being president. They've largely let it go. Like in comparison. I see. I don't know if I agree with that. In comparison, they don't. It's not even on the same scale. Well, I, mean, I, I don't know if anybody could even make that argument, to be honest. Well, I mean, I agree it's not on the same scale. But to be fair, at the time, like Trump was much far more widely hated and had far more press about how horrible he was. Yeah, because he was covered constantly and smeared 24-7. Now, now that's not saying that he didn't. Insert foot in mouth, say stupid, crude, or mean things. He did. But sure. the fact that those aspects, which are fairly minor to me, because Joe Biden says stupid stuff every other hour, and Trump is just like, he's still not living it down. Like, they still talk about it. when If he mentions that he's going to start a social media uh, website or if he's going to run in 2024, and they bring all of it back up. It just it doesn't stop. The, the left is very good about collecting the things that they don't like and bringing it up to haunt you yeah and i agree with that like i definitely agree with that my biggest thing though is that knowing that left media is dominant because i've because i listen to a lot of conservative podcasts i listen to a lot of different things a lot mm -hmm. of different articles i watch them call out joe biden constantly constantly but the press does not cover it the same way they cover trump Mm -hmm. because and at this point it's hard to cover for biden anymore because he's he is just so clearly gone like i don't even like just oh i, I can't i can't he's it's gotten that bad um i think this is the longest like i told you so to anyone that voted <laughs> for uh joe biden because they just did it because they hated trump and, yeah, they and, didn't and we about, told you so that it was a bad idea Right. This, I mean, it wasn't just... I mean, also told you so that oh the, the independents didn't have a chance in this race because of the, the, the Trumpists and then the Trump haters. Like, and then we saw record turnout voting for both candidates. Right. Like Trump lost, but it still smashed previous records. Well, and Biden set one above him. Right. And they also predicted that there was going to be a huge blue wave, right? They're like, oh... Biden's just going to win by a ton. Mm -hmm. That did not happen. There also wasn't a red wave, though. There wasn't either. It, it seemed like we had red wave predictions on conservative side, and we had blue wave predictions on the liberal sides. And neither happened. It was, I mean, get, all things given, it was fairly tight. Yeah, I would say it was pretty tight. It wasn't an incredible win for Biden. Uh, he won, but it wasn't an incredible win. Mm -hmm. the, I think the reason why he got so many votes is because everyone hated Trump yes. that much. Uh, and that's why he got those votes. Yeah. Don't, don't underestimate the hate that the, the left media tends to, to play through. And they did a fantastic job for four years. They playing did up a the great hate. job. They did a really, really good job. Uh, hats off to them. I hope, um, I hope that people think twice about 2022 and, who you're going to vote for. And don't and, listen to polls because they've been wrong for the last two elections. Like yeah. egregiously wrong. Very wrong. They're not, they're, not, they're not even close. They're not worth looking at to even see. Yeah. they're Just they're vote. Not. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, all I can say. had a lot of conservatives that are hiding. I think that was a lot of what happened is that mm -hmm. a lot of people, like I think even you told me at one point you messed around with a pollster. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I messed around with several pollsters. Yeah, you, and I think there's people who are doing that too and and they just kind of voted how they wanted to and said, I'm going to vote for Trump because you're crazy. Mm -hmm. You're crazy and you're mean. And if I tell you that I'm voting for Trump or if I'm voting for a conservative, you're going to hammer me and tell me that I'm a horrible racist bigot. Like no one, no one wants to be called that. No one wants that. No, I don't especially want that. when they're not. Right, and that's what's been just infuriating 
to me. I use the word infuriating a lot because I get infuriated very <laughs> easily. Um, but part of the, even the reason why I wanted to do this podcast was because of 2020, I have never felt like so bullied in my life by believing, if I just believe something different, then I'm going to get called racist mm-hmm. or I'm going to get be called a bigot. Like these words have powerful meanings and we have, we're calling decent citizens all these things and not even just relig- religious people, but just normal people that enjoy their freedom and enjoy America and love what it has to offer. And so to get bullied like that, there comes a point, I think, where we have a lot of silent conservatives because they, they got to keep their jobs. They got to they just got to keep keep the peace. But I enjoy doing this podcast because I can kind of give a voice to some of these issues. And actually, people are able to hear me talk, not just an article or something I write on Facebook. Like I want people to hear my tone mm-hmm. and hear where I'm coming from, where it's not that I'm against um, immigration. I just have a lot of problems with legal immigration because it causes issues, you know, for our children right. that are getting trafficked. Um, and that's a bit, and then drugs, this is an issue for me. That's where my heart goes out. And I say, okay, we need to do better. How mm-hmm. can we do better, uh, in this regard? As the same thing for other, for other issues that I can talk about. The reason why I go against a lot of the mainstream narrative is not because I don't care. It's because I do care. And I care enough to, you know, use a little bit of wisdom, use some discernment, use my emotions too, and say, as much as this is emotionally appealing, I'm looking at the facts and actually going this way is going to be a lot better in the long run, even if it doesn't seem as empathetic Mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, I think that looking at the long run is a really important thing when it comes to making decisions. It was important when it came to voting between Hillary and Trump, Trump and Biden. It'll be important again in 2024 20, uh, and especially the on the local level. Uh, that's mm-hmm. important. And yeah. that's something that I've been uh, I've fallen short in in my lifetime and definitely plan on making a more robust research into who they are, because quite frankly, if I get to the ballot and I look at a list of names and I don't recognize them, I, I shouldn't be clicking any of them, despite where they have a they have an R for Republican or a D for Democrat next to them. Just as, don't even. Don't even bother because you don't know anything about them and you shouldn't be voting for them. So you just give up that vote. You didn't do your homework and, and move on to the ballot to the parts that you do know. And, and it gets hard when you get down to like, who are you going to vote for? Like park officials or whatever. And you're like, right. oh, sometimes, sometimes you do just kind of check like like if they're you dip, typically will want for me, I typically want a Republican in there instead of a Democrat. So but for like the big ones, like our senators mm-hmm. um, and obviously our president, like those ones, I feel like those are the ones I'd give the biggest amount of my research to. Yes. Because I feel like if people actually like had researched Biden, they would have found a lot of issues. No, they, uh, they had them. people they had people um, just before the election who had already caught heard and cast votes when they found out that uh joe biden was at least potentially connected to hunter biden's spree of drugs and women and uh money that he was taking from other countries because his dad was the vp at one point and now running for president all of this stuff and they would they said that they would probably would have thought about changing their vote at that point but you know that that comes back to online censorship thanks twitter uh for banning the new york post who is it jack dorsey is that his name yeah yeah I, he, I don't think he's I don't know that he's actually the head of the CEO anymore. He's kind of the face of Twitter, but I don't I don't think he's I don't think he's head of it anymore. No. But it's still Twitter as an entity. I, I mean, the yeah. the concept still stands when you have these social media tech companies that get to be the arbiters of truth and the gatekeepers and they decide who comes and who stays. Right. And I think a lot of that was the 2016 election changed everything. Yes, it changed everything, and they realized that they needed to procure more information and just make sure that certain things made it in, certain things didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, they just kind of they just kind of changed uh, all around. Yeah, it did. Um, and another change and kind of a long, you know, down the road, long game thing that I wanted to bring up, and I don't want this to turn into a talk about COVID segment because, quite frankly, I'm really tired of hearing about COVID. I wanted to talk about COVID for another three hours, Connor. No, you didn't. Stop it. There, there's no... There's no. <laughs> what? What? But 
it, this is something that I've been wondering when it was going to hit, and it, and it asks a bigger question. Um, but CBS did a segment, uh, a Colorado health system denies, uh, I'm trying to say her name right, Lee Lilani. I, I'm, I'm going to go with that. They, they denied Lilani Latuli a kidney transplant because she refused to get COVID-19 vaccine due to religious beliefs. Um, and she's not an isolated story right now. Um, there, there are people around the country that have not gotten vaccinated, sometimes for medical reasons. Most of them are probably for re- religious reasons or just being stubborn and they don't want it. And now they're being refused medical services that are, I would say, life-saving. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would not consider COVID to be life-saving when you're, the survival rate is over 98% at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, at least for the vast majority of people it is. And, and now these are not these are not healthy individuals. These are people that need a transplant. And that puts them in a more vulnerable category. And Lilani believes in the sanctity of life, and she won't get the vaccine due to the involvement of fetal cells in the testing phase of Pfizer Moderna in the production phase of Johnson & Johnson. Um, the interesting part in that interview with CBS is that they, they brought on Arthur Cowlin, uh, who's a professor of bioethics at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. He agreed that it was ethical to deny an organ transplant if the patient is not vaccinated against something like COVID, saying that you can't put they can't put people at further risk of dying from the transplant and risk losing the organ. And the hospitals are saying they believe that the candidates have a better chance of surviving uh, the transplant. And, and looking at the studies that he cited, if I'm understanding it correct, at least among waitlisted candidates, uh, the, the mortality rate for 2020 was 24% higher. Um, and this is specifically for kidney transplants. So you're on the kidney waitlist, 24% higher. Well, after you get the transplant, you're still dealing with 20% chances of mortality rate. because So it's the same. It's very, very close. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and it's, because, it's because you're dealing, I believe you got to take the immunosuppressants for life now, uh, so that your body doesn't reject the new organ. Um, but the, the, the study was posted in the clinical journal of the American society of nephrology. And this is, they were specifically looking at kidney transplants okay. and I'll read the results here. Um, we, we, I can't wait to get the website up so we can start posting these links and people can go find them for themselves. I feel like that was a slight burn towards me. <laughs> Guys, I'm responsible for putting the website up. I haven't yet. And and I There's and the no podcasts excuse. are coming out on Tuesday because I don't get them out on Monday. <laughs> See, we're we're now we're even, Connor. Now we're even. Okay. We're even now. I feel better. Okay. All right. Uh, results among deaths of patients who were waitlisted in 2020, 11 percent were attributed to COVID-19, and these candidates were more likely to be male, obese, and belong to a racial ethnic minority group. Nearly one in six deaths, 16%, among active transplant recipients in the United States in 2020 was attributed to COVID-19. Recipients who died of COVID-19 were younger, more likely to be obese, had lower educational attainment, and were more likely to belong to racial and ethnic minority groups than those who died of other causes in 2020 or 2019. We found higher overall mortality in 2020 among waitlisted candidates, 24%, Then among kidney transplant recipients, 20% compared with 2019. Mm -hmm. These are pretty negligible percentages. And um, I've got a quote here that several single center reports suggest higher morbidity and mortality among candidates. this, This is kind of begging the question for me, Jordan, when this has become essentially a, a social currency. Of, of a type and it's been bothering me for a while of being vaccinated yes vaccination being the social currency in america if people are not up to date on it china has implemented a social currency where the way that you interact with the public uh, in person and online deems what you are able and not able to do in their country you want to sell your house have you been a jerk online no you can't sell your house you lose your position at your job you can't move up in your position in your job because they've deemed your social credit score to be negligible and it we're kind of in it it's 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 a weird state and this this happened a couple months ago uh with new york city but 
and, and they've had pretty limited success with this, but here's here's some places I just wanted to list, at least in America, and this is New York City. California is doing this too, and so is Hawaii. They're probably different because they're different states, but this is at least New York City. The following type of establishments will be required to ask for proof of vaccination for entry. Again, this is starting to look like a social currency to me, but here are the places. Movie theaters, live music and concert venues, museums and galleries, aquariums and zoos, professional sports stadiums and arenas, convention centers, exhibition halls, performing art theaters, bowling alleys, recreational game centers, arcades, and and pool and billiard halls, casinos and adult entertainment, restaurants and bars, catering halls and event spaces, hotel banquet rooms, uh, cabarets and nightclubs, cafeterias, grocery stores with indoor dining, bakeries and coffee shops, fast food and quick service eateries with indoor dining, gyms and fitness centers and fitness class venues, pools, dance studios, and sport classes. Those are all the places that you need to have proof of vaccination to go. That sounds like all of society. Pretty much. Now, I was in New York City recently, and I was able to go at least into a bookstore, so that was nice. Uh, But as for eating, all I could do was go in and take something to go. Like, they at least permit that. Um, and, and I'm unveiling that I'm not vaccinated and it's largely for religious and now anti-government re- reasons. Um, we can probably do a podcast on that later, but this is, I'll interview you. Yes, you can interview me. Um, I'll be like the Peter Ducey of resident skeptics, <laughs> the resident skeptics press room. All right. But that I'll be Petra. There you go. Petra. Petra. Ducey. Sure. You can go with Petra Ducey. Okay, great. It's like they, they out they, all these places. If you don't have a vaccine in New York City, you no longer can take part in them. And now I didn't have too much of an issue while I was there getting food, but uh, in the colder months when I go to visit, it will be a lot more difficult because it'll be freezing in New York. So I'm going to be have to grab food, and it's going to need to be near my hotel because that's going to be the only place that I can go inside and eat is inside in my hotel room. Surprisingly, hotels don't mandate that you that that didn't drop into the their new laws in the state um but they lose i feel like lose some business that way wouldn't they you would think uh and they they add a little bit more to it as well following indoor settings are not required uh to bar unvaccinated people so this this is what this is what you they they don't have to bar you but they can if the establishment so chooses of course Uh, dining where food is consumed elsewhere, like fast food eateries. So that's what I had to do. Uh, businesses that opt to get rid of indoor seating. So it's New York. Again, (laughs) it's going to be cold. What do you do with the indoor seating? And this is, this is the best part. And for the people that have not been to New York city recently, when they had the, uh, the COVID rules that you could not eat indoors, you needed to have outdoor seating. You know what they did? They built little outdoor structures of wood and plexiglass and plastic. So they just made... Inside. They made inside outside the new the new outside. That is what they did. They took your inside oh seating. Gosh. They put it outside inside another box, but it's outside. You're just in a box outside, like you yes. would be in a house. With way from what I was looking at the structures, with way less airflow and air exchange values within those rooms. So you were just Connor. Don't be anti science about this. I don't know, I'm just pissed about it. <laughs> Connor, all these reasonable things you're saying, they sound a little anti-science to me. You need to follow the science. This is this is uh, getting a little bit out of hand. I'm being scientific. I'm questioning it. I'm questioning what the heck they are doing in these places. Um, but among the other lists, places, residential buildings, great. Homes. Office buildings didn't require it. Child care programs. Well, thank God we can still send the kids to child care. Uh, pre-K, with their masks on. Yeah, with their masks on. Pre-K through 12, public, non-public school, senior centers, odd. Um, what? Yeah, that one's actually that one's really weird. But you know, New York has a history of trying to kill the older people with COVID. I was saying, COVID, I was like, so. did, did Governor Cuomo make that one? It looks like they're still doing it. Oh my gosh, what is wrong? That's not this changing. Is horrible. This is horrible. Senior centers. Yeah, you don't. You, you don't need to be vaccinated to come in here. Not that I'm going to make. I I, I question where the vaccine is at with some of the stuff. But churches hosting Sunday potlucks or similar events. It doesn't list services, so I'm, I'm I've, I've been confused that on that one. Is very sketchy. Community centers, charitable food services, catering at home. These are those are the places that you don't you, you're not required to bar unvaccinated people. Um, this sounds like segregation to me. It, it's running segregation, but also social currency. I mean that that is social currency. You don't have a vaccine, great. You can't eat in a restaurant. 
You can't go to a bar. You can't go to a club. You can't go bowling. You can't go to an arcade. You can't go to an indoor swimming pool. All, All these places, all of a sudden, you can't go. You can't go to your grocery store if they serve food. So I hope they don't serve food to you. Mm. and it just it begs the question it begs a couple of questions for me um and i wanted to hear your thoughts on this is and and we can go one by one here but the first is does this not look like a social currency to you at this point as they as they implement these things it's not just a social currency it's a moral currency right because if you don't get the vaccine well you must you must want to kill grandma you must not care about people Mm -hmm. uh, if if you don't or you must care about freedom more, as as Biden has uh, said in his his uh. town hall. Um, it's it's more than a social currency. It's a moral. It's a moral currency. It's a. It's a moral high ground. It is that someone who, if you know, I'm not going to reveal whether or not I am vaccinated. Unlike Connor, <laughs> um, I'm fine. Wasn't going to, and then definitely ousted myself there. Yeah. It's it is what it is. Yeah, I'm I'm fairly pro vaccine for most things. Get the vaccine. Don't get it. Doesn't matter to me. Um, yep. But if, you know, let's say, you know, I, I have the vaccine, right? I have the vaccine. Does that make me a better person than you? Because I, I care about people and I, I care about, you know, them not getting COVID when really the people that are most vulnerable, they ought, I think they ought to be getting the vaccine. Uh, yes. The people that are, that are vulnerable. I think an experimental vaccine is worth it um, if you are in you know, your 60s to, you know, 70s, even, you know, 50s, just depending on where your health is, right? And what your, uh, if you're overweight or you're obese or if you have diabetes, you know, name something mm-hmm. um, that might make you at higher risk. But yes, I believe it's deeper than just social currency. It is a certain level of moral currency. And not only that, it's a currency that I believe is meant to divide us. Um, some have and some do not. And so that's going to be something that we're watching play out right now, as you've talked about uh, in New York. And I want to say California is doing something similar. Um, yeah, I believe it's coming to Los Angeles. Hawaii's already doing this as well. Yeah, Hawaii is pretty. Yeah, they already started doing that. So, yes, that is the answer to your first question. Mm-hmm. And the second is the the ethical issue that we're dealing with, with them denying medical procedures to people that clearly have a medical problem and it will affect them down the road versus something like covid that may or may not affect them right it's uh this 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 would also relate i think it was in uh it was in europe and i don't remember i want to say it was france but there was a preemie baby that was born and was not doing well and the hospital said we're not going to we're, we're not going to try to keep this this kid alive they got to decide whether or not they the parents could fight for that child's life yes. or not. Yes, and there I, were I other there this. were other hospitals, including ones in the United States, that said they would take the infant and they would work to try and save the infant's life. And the decision was taken out of the parents' hands by the government. So the government gets to decide whether you've got a good enough chance, which is something they can't know. They're only working off of statistics. It, it's not pertinent to the individual. They're just working off the statistics. They're like, oh, you have a you have a slightly better chance of surviving, and this is probably worth it. Well, funny part, during that interview with the doctor, um, Dr. Callen, well, actually, no, Professor Callen, he had said uh, he had said that we're short on organs, and hopefully we get more. And I was like, what the heck does that mean? Uh, yeah, that's he, a he used bad. it as a little plant for organ donor, but, and I was like, I get that. I just think it was... Poorly timed. I it think was, that was poorly like timed. Poorly timed. Was like, I, I see where he we're was short. coming from, but we need more. I, hope I mean, we get more. I mean, soon. more people that, need to get signed diabolical. up. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounded it sounded a little diabolical. I'm just like, yeah, you might not want to have said that. Yeah, that was that was probably that was probably a bad idea. Yeah, I think at this point, you know, if you're going to not let someone who's not vaccinated, uh, sorry, uh, have someone who's not vaccinated not allow them to get a transplant. Like, then you have to start refusing other people, too. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, if you're not taking care of your health, like, if uh, you're a smoker, we shouldn't we shouldn't treat smokers anymore. They're doing it to themselves. It's their choice. Like, we shouldn't help them, right? According to this logic. No, we shouldn't. And we shouldn't help the, the morbidly obese people. No, nope, because it's their fault. Their fault. They, they don't deserve medical attention. Um, like, so this, this logic... They're applying it to something specific, but once you start applying it generally, it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And 
yes, I have an ethical issue with it. Also, if depending on who these people are, like I don't, again, I don't really know. Maybe there's a reason why they haven't gotten the vaccine yet. Uh, maybe they are concerned about the side effects. And if they are unhealthy um, and their body has issues, who knows? <laughs> who knows what that vaccine can do? Right. Um, and, and this comes down to something more important, which is medical freedom. With, we, again, we talk, we've talked earlier about government becoming God, right? Mm-hmm. And part of government becoming God, with the same thing with that baby, is they get to decide. And once you break down, once you get rid of God, once you get rid of family, what should be happening is I should be talking with my family and saying, sh- should I get this vaccine? What's What's best for me? What should I do? Right? Like they're the ones I talk to God about. Like these are the these are the people and the entity that I that I answer to. And they're the ones that should be getting a say in that. Not the government. Especially on a vaccine that has no longitudinal studies because it simply hasn't been around long enough. Supposed to other vaccines where we have a lot more research and we have a lot more data on them. So I think at this point I think it I think it's fair to clarify that we have we, we probably have more data on COVID than most other treatments because every country out there seems to be studying it. But I, I think the point that you're making there that I just want to clarify is that we don't have data on long-term Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. Because it's, it's only yes. existed for a year. So as far as data on long-term effects go, yes. it's none. And there's plenty of problems with the various reporting system right now of all the different talk with doctors and such uh, Project Veritas has come out with it. Joe Rogan's talked about it with some of the the medical professionals that he's had on his podcast, where you you've got two different problems with the VARES. And one one is a it, it apparently takes about thirty minutes to fill out, and they just don't have that that kind of time. But there are people that are hesitant to report side effects because they're not sure if it's a side effect of the vaccine, and they don't want to mislead. And then there's people that do want to mislead and purposely do it. So all in all, it's a very flawed system, and we don't really have. I have yet to hear from anybody that they have a good way of tracking these type of effects. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And your clarification is correct. I mean, about the long term side effects of this vaccine and even the immediate side effects as well, especially with someone who needs a surgery or a transplant. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and we don't have we don't have good data. And in terms and also with not having, excuse me, reliable data. Um, and, and to add to that, I would also say that the public um, health communication has been garbage on this. So you've created another layer of unreliability. You have, you know, not having good data or just people not filling it out or not being sure. And mm-hmm. then the health uh, public health communication just being absolutely screwed to high heavens. No one knows what to believe. And then Biden gets frustrated that people don't want to get vaccinated, even though Kamala Harris is like, well, if if, if, if Trump made the vaccine, then, then then I won't take it. You know, she, she said that in November. I'm like, good grief. What do you what do you think? He, it's yeah, you like, think you think Trump directly had a hand? In yeah, you think thing? like Trump was the one that like legit formulated it. It's like, no, he didn't. He didn't the only thing he can maybe formulate is probably his, his cup of coffee in the morning. Mm-hmm. That's probably about it. Um but I don't even know where, where we were going with that. But just having medical freedom is what we were, were talking about. Yeah, yeah and the, the lack of it that, that is coming now and the, the ethical issues. And uh, somebody did make an argument today, and I am trying to remember what it is. Cause I, I want to bring these counterpoints of how people are looking at it. And right. I can kind of see the rational thought that they're making on this is that, well, if this person has a better chance of getting it, then we better not you know let the organ go to waste. Which is, I mean, it's a fairly cruel way to put it, but, you know, if, if somebody does have a really high chance of dying and they they opt to put it in somebody that has a better chance of surviving than that one, then is that morally and ethically the correct thing? Or should they, they just they continue on with the list? Because there is the argument to be made that if, if it is found for sure that people that are uh, not vaccinated are creating a bigger issue in the hospitals with the numbers. And I've mixed opinions on those things. And the, the numbers for me have been kind of all over. Are you talking about like specifically, I'm not talking about people who get hospitalized, but to people who are unvaccinated and need transplants or. That, and that's, that was one of the things. So on that, that study that I was reading, it doesn't look like they specify between 
vaccinated, unvaccinated patients, although the data is 2019. So it was 2019 and 2020. So I'm imagining that they're probably unvaccinated patients. And this is... Is that the the data they're gathering from. And this is what's what's interesting to me. Like, I, I, I hear your... Oops, I just touched the mic. Hi, Sorry. Mike. Because <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm moving my hands now because I'm, I'm starting to get worked up and very hot in here. For the first time ever, I'm hot in this room. I'm always cold. And Connor's the one that's always very, very warm in <laughs> It's here. very warm right now. So, Thanks, son. Well, it, it makes for better lighting. It does make for better lighting. It also makes us very warm. Well, it typically makes you just very warm, but today I'm warm as well. Ha, now you know how I feel. Don't rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> Let me continue. Um, oh, oh, crap. What was I talking about? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. We're um, isolating like just whether or not the COVID vaccine makes you healthier. Like we're, we're only isolating that variable. Mm-hmm. Like if someone is, you know, obese, right? And they're vaccinated, like... Does that and automatically stated that in this survey too, or in this uh, Does this that medical make report? Them healthier than someone who's unvaccinated and besides needing a transplant, you know, yeah. in in fairly good shape. Like they're saying, as if the the COVID vaccine is like the de- the determining factor about whether or not you can get this procedure. And yep. that kind of yeah, that yeah. troubles me. It always troubles me isolating variables. That always troubles me a little bit. It is because I mean they even listed some of these in here. It's like male, so it's sexist. It's a sexist virus. Obese. It's it's also it's also fat shaming. And and then, and then you belong to racial ethnic uh, minority group. That's kind of been an odd one ever since the beginning of COVID. That I yeah. that nobody has provided a solid answer on is why. I hear people say, yeah, it's healthcare problems. I'm like, well, then the third world countries would be absolutely devastated hmm. and they're not yeah i, I mean they have i'm not i'm not gonna say they i'm not gonna say they had a good go of it but it uh and actually this is this one's funny this is actually from the the podcast with sanjay gupta and joe rogan as sanjay noted that first world countries by and large were affected more heavily by covid than third world countries I think a lot of that might have to do with, I I think at least, I have nothing, I'm sure there are studies to back this up. We are not doctors, don't take our medical (laughs) advice, these are purely opinions, talk to your own doctor, and if you don't like your doctor, get a different one. That could literally be a voiceover for a prescription. (laughs) That could be a voiceover for a prescription. I would listen to that in the whisper, don't go. (laughs) We'll read off off the side effects in a whisper. (laughs) A very awkward, uncomfortable whisper. <laughs> I'm sorry. Get this drug. Makes your life great. Except for all the side effects. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be a fantastic commercial. Oh, it, it, might, then, it, it then, might even inspire me to get that. And, even if I don't and need then it. you play like dark music with the whisper. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, duh. With the sad <laughs> violins going along with it. Yeah. No, it would be amazing. <laughs> okay. Um... Oh, what was I saying now? Oh, I don't even remember. <laughs> oh, wait. Yes, I'm not a doctor. This is just my opinion. Um, Dr. Estabrook does have a good ring to it, though. That does. It does. Maybe you should go back to college for like another eight years. You must be out of your dang mind. <laughs> I'm not going back. Just to get a DR at the beginning of your name. That's right. No, I, I, I want to I be just like Dr. Jill Biden. I want to be just like her. So I'm going to teach at community college as well. Just um, get your doctorate in some really easy degree, and then you can have it. All right. Dr. Estabrook of Gender Studies. That'll be me. Um, anyway, um, just my opinion on it. I think a lot of it is I don't think Americans as a whole are incredibly healthy. I, do I would agree. We That's have a probably... lot of obesity, and, mm-hmm. and I think the whole body positive movement has encouraged people to Oh, remain... look. In the, in the long run... It might not be such a good thing. Yes, yes. And this is, again, this is not this is not fat shaming. This is not me trying to do that. I'm just saying that if you are over a certain body percentage, you're going to have a harder time and you're more and you're more likely to get certain diseases and diseases. diseases yeah, diabetes, and heart issues. problems. Yes. Which there's a large assortment of. And it, the list just keeps going. Right. And this is more for people's general health and it's like sure short term maybe you help some people feel like they weren't being shamed by the public and you know to be comfortable in their skin except that down the road something like covid would come up and it would be what is it is it 
was it seventy percent of COVID uh, patients? I don't want to cite this one. I don't remember if it's thirty or seventy, and I, I'm probably that's reversing a big. Those that's numbers. a big. Dif- that's a big. It's number a big, and it's just a, it's depending on if I'm thinking thirty percent of them were healthy or thirty percent were were unhealthy. Well, even not just with obesity, but like with people that had underlying health issues already, um, they were going to have. Uh, there's going to be a bigger likelihood that they were going to have difficulties with COVID-19. Well, I think COVID and anything else. Right, right. Because um, then Colin oh, Powell... Oh, I found it. 78% of people hospitalized oh. for COVID were overweight or obese. So there's your majority right there. More than three quarters of them are unhealthy. Right. So if we're following the science, right, I think this for anyone, like whether, whether I don't even know what to say, but no matter what, even if COVID weren't here which it's hard to imagine life without it at this point. Mm -hmm. I miss it. Yeah, me too. That maybe it's good to have physical exercise and to eat well in in eating well in moderation, exercising in moderation, because you can also go the other way of just destroying your body with too much exercise, um, not giving yourself enough healthy fats and, and loving your body where it is, but still working Mm-hmm. to make it a healthier body for you, for your children, uh, for your husband or your wife, uh, for your family, because uh, you're able to do so much more uh, when you're feeling healthy. And, and last much longer. Take care of your, take care of your grandkids or mm-hmm. you know, be yeah. there to enjoy that time with them. That's, that's one thing that's affected me in my personal life was that with my grandfather on, uh, on my mom's side, he really didn't take care of himself very much. And he was obese and he had... Oh, so many things. He 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 did. He ran out of room in his first like really big week long pill tray, so he had a second pill tray to go with it because of all the things. And this is this is where I have a beef with doctors too: is all the medication problems that he ran into when doctors wouldn't check what he was already on, and they give him something, it would make the side effects worse. Yeah, because medications pre- react with each other. Yeah, it, it just that's the you know. But then on the same time, I had doctors save his life multiple times, and that was from regular flu that he would get. He'd get a flu, and then it would turn into pneumonia, and then he would almost die. And he for certain would have gotten wrecked if he had COVID. And I don't think he would have made it. But he passed before that time, so he didn't have to deal with it. But that being said, like there was a lot of things that he didn't get to do with us because of his health. And I'm really proud of my parents at watching them get, uh, they're going to the gym at least once a day. I've seen them go more than that. Um, and they're trying to make sure that my younger siblings are, are raised up going to the gym and watching what they put in their body, although they still eat freaking Takis and Cheetos all the time. <laughs> kids, sometimes kids are... They just, they're yeah. like, yeah, I got five bucks. I'm going to go get me a Red Bull and a bag of Takis. And then I'm going to go to the gym and work out. <laughs> and Never had a Red Bull, by the way. No? Never, Any energy drinks? Nev- nope. Never had a Monster. Never had a Red Bull. Never had, never had a drop. We're going to give you a G Fuel. Oh, heck no. Well, Mountain Dew is just a soda. It's yeah. really high in sugar. And well, my mom, my mom was very... She was definitely very strict about energy drinks and things mm-hmm. that were super sugary. Like she would let us have juice and stuff, but it wasn't all the time. So once and when my siblings and I got older, we started eating and drinking more of that stuff. And then it's kind of weird, even though I thought my mom was kind of a little bit strict about it. Mm-hmm. I ended up kind of reverting back to that where I don't drink a ton of soda yep. anymore. And also for people listening, I've had health issues myself. So it made me really reevaluate, you know, what I was putting in my body and what I was choosing to do, even though I'm actually very, but everyone now knows my weight. Thanks to Connor. (laughs) I am. (laughs) Thanks Connor. Um, I am 130 pounds. I was like, I was what you call like fat skinny where at the time I was like 110 pounds, Okay. but I was kind of like, basically I was skinny eating like garbage, but wasn't like gaining any weight. But was so your metabolism super... was taking care of the, was yeah. taking care of the fat, but she didn't have any muscle built on. No, I remember I was driving in my car one time and I just wanted to like, I lifted up my arm and I touched my bicep and I could feel the other side of it because there was literally no muscle there. Oh. So, um, it's not, again, it's not even about how you look. Cause I looked quote unquote fine, mm-hmm. but I wasn't healthy. And that's what I care about for most people. So you can even not be overweight and still be unhealthy. Yep. It is definitely Yeah, this is, this is not just for people that look like they're overweight. It is for the people that are also thin. It's just like thin does not mean healthy. 
exactly. 100, 100% agree with that. Uh, as someone, as someone who knows, <laughs> um, definitely, definitely not. But man, we have talked about a lot today. It's and it's kind of gone all over the place, but I mean, a lot of this stuff has become intertwined, and I think people's yeah. personal health—that's that is a really big thing, and it's becoming more important to me as I get older. And it's not as easy to shed those pounds as it was. I remember when I was younger, it was like, oh, I feel like I, um, I see my, I would see my stomach starting to get bigger because I was getting lazy and sitting around all summer or whatever I was doing, or probably actually probably through the winter I was sitting around not doing anything. Yeah, and then like one month of push-up sit-ups and half mile runs and i was back to being super fit and that takes a lot more work now as i've as i'm approaching 30 years old right so for anybody that's younger than me you better kick it in gear now yeah no this is the time it's real the 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 slowdown for it it's it's a lot more difficult to see those results yeah and i'd also say too um for any of the women that might be listening I think that being, again, as I have said, and I cannot stress this enough, being skinny, if, if you losing weight is to be skinny, that can also be unhealthy. I'd rather someone be weighing more and have more muscle on them, be eating well, be eating mm-hmm. good grains, good foods. It's not always about the weight. It's about it's about the muscle. It's about what you're eating. I'm, again, I'm not a nutritionist or anything, but I just want to make that clear that you shouldn't look at someone else's body and think that's what I should be when people have vastly different metabolisms yep. and, and just kind of landing points for where their body is at. That's just where that's just where I come at it. Um, uh, I, I mean, I guess a good gauge would be you know, go go try and run at a decent pace. Go try and run a mile. See how you feel afterwards. Yeah. If you feel like absolute garbage, then you need to work on it. And and then it's probably your diet and your exercise. And those are probably that, that's one of the things that's bothered me the most about this pandemic is that the government has not. I mean, they've talked about health in the past, but they really haven't as far as preventing COVID is that if you are healthy, congrats, you're in the you're in the rare 22 percent of uh, hospitalizations. Now that we know 78 mm-hmm. percent of them are unhealthy people. And that's just that was just the obese ones. I don't I don't even know if that has to do with uh, people with other com- comorbidities. Um, but that for something like this and other things like your regular flu season, it, being healthy is one of the best things that you could possibly do. Uh, and if we spent the amount of time exercising and, and researching our diet that we did on Instagram and TikTok, then we would probably be a lot better off for it. Yeah, uh, as social media is a time suck. We could be doing a lot of other things and always a convicting point whenever I talk about it with anyone. That's um, right. Especially here. But again, no no body shaming from Connor and I. Just some... We just want people to be healthy. Yeah. I think that's the goal. It's not about the way your body looks. I just, I just want people to be healthy. Exactly. Uh, just... Be healthy. You know, you're, you're, it's less of a burden on your own life and then on the people around you. Yeah. And so. I, I want to be there for my, I want to be there for my kids and for also women uh, who are, you know, trying to get pregnant. Uh, typically, if you, if you're actually a bit more in shape when you get pre- pregnant, that kind of helps uh, with mm-hmm. the pregnancy and you do tend to kind of bounce back a little bit better from what I know. I've obviously, I've, well, I don't know if it's obvious. Some people <laughs> might not know who I am. Uh, I am not pregnant uh, or married. So it's not really, not, happening. not I don't have an experience on it, but yeah, I definitely know that just being healthier means sometimes it can mean a healthier pregnancy. Mm-hmm. I, I would agree. The, at least as my mom and, you know, a lot of, and like I remember she played on a team uh, of women for volleyball from church and uh, one of the ladies there was just always working out and she was pregnant and she continued to play volleyball eight months into her pregnancy. Yeah. And, and then within one month of after giving birth, she was back in the gym playing volleyball with them. She yeah. had the quickest bounce back that I've seen. Yeah. And some of it is genuinely genetics. It is because like, not, not women all women are able to do it. not work out at eight yeah. months. Like, so it's, again, we understand it's going to be a case by case uh, situation, but, you know. It's case by case and blanket health things yes. like, like a global vaccine oh my might God. have some side effects. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh, I don't want to stay on COVID too much longer, but I think it is important to note, um, as of right now, the CDC has said that they're not going to update the definition of what full vaccination is. Um, well, they have to consult the Biden administration first. That's right. They need to go talk yes, to the so-called experts. That first. is important. So 
good conversation here. Yep. It's been a good um, time. Something that I, I did want to focus on. So they, the Biden administration did say on Friday in a uh, article from the Washington Times that they're not changing the definition of what it means to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 after the Center for Disease Control and Prevention greatly expanded the range of people eligible for booster doses. Um, they've reserved the right to revisit the definition, however, um, a point that could irk critics who fear that goalposts around vaccines and workplace mandates will move around. Um, looking at the history of it, maybe they changed some terminology where it was like, oh, you know, to be vaccinated means you're immune against this. And they're like, well, maybe you're not immune. So I don't know if this is so much of a big deal. Um, we'll see what happens if they change whatever vaccinated means. Mm -hmm. But at least as far as being fully vaccinated, uh, studies confirm uh, that waning immunity from Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, and this is from CNN Health, and who wrote the article? Maggie Fox. Uh, two real-world studies published Wednesday confirmed that the immune protection offered by two doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine drops off after two months or so, although protection against severe disease, hospitalization, hospitalization and death remains strong. That's this, good. That's the good part. Like, that's what we care about, right? Yes. We don't want people dying. If it's if you get the vaccine and, you know, you could have had hospitalization symptoms, instead you have a cold mm -hmm. or even a mild or low fever, that's way better than having to go to the hospital. That's what we should... We've been living with this for a while, especially when people get, you know, the fever or have the flu. Like, yep. that's what matters. Mm -hmm. That's what matters to me. That's all I care about. That's fair. Um, just to, to continue here. So the studies are from Israel and Qatar, um, and they were published in the New England Journal of Medicine and support arguments that even fully vaccinated people need to maintain precautions against infection. And so this is, this is where I, this is where booster shots are coming in, everybody. Um, a study from Israel covered 4,800 healthcare workers and showed antibody levels wane rapidly after two doses of vaccine, especially among men. Again, I, I don't understand what the genetics are there for men. Yeah, that's interesting. Men were harder hit, and now they're, it's at least from this study, they're, they're dropping faster. Um, among persons 65 years of age or older, and among persons with immunosuppression. So Israel's study conducted it on that uh, category, um, and they said, we conducted this perspect this prospective longitudinal cohort study involving healthcare workers in Sheba Medical Center at large uh, tertiary medical center in Israel. And the results is that the researchers noted that levels of so-called neutralizing antibodies, the immune system's first line of defense against infection, correlate with protection against infection. But for this study, they studied only antibodies levels. And, quote, they published work about many vaccines, such as those against measles, mumps, and rubella, um, have shown small decrease in each year of 5 to 10% in the neutralizing antibody levels. And they wrote that a significant and rapid decrease in uh, humoral response to the, sorry, this is going to be the technical term for Pfizer, but the bnt 16 b 2 vaccine. We're going to continue to call it Pfizer for the sake of that. Um, but finally, they indicated that immunity for people who get vaccinated after natural COVID-19 infections lasts longer. Um, it's especially strong for people who recovered from infection and then got vaccinated also. Um, overall, the accumulating evidence from our study and others show that long-term humor response and vaccine effectiveness in previously infected persons were superior to that in recipients of two doses of the vaccine. Um, so they're finding that the levels are dropping off for the vaccinated, but they're finding, at least in this study, that the antibodies that are generated by naturally getting COVID and beating it are sticking around. Um, and then the second one from Qatar, let me see, I want to get the, the right um, paragraph here so that I'm not reading through all their extra stuff here. Um, but the Pfizer-induced protection against, vac against infection builds rapidly after the first dose, peaks in the first month, after the second dose, and then gradually wanes in subsequent months. Uh, the waning appears to decelerate after the fourth month to reach a low level of approximately 20% in subsequent months. So only after your four months of being fully vaccinated, you've dropped down to 20% effectiveness. Um, but they are saying that the protection against hospitalization and death has still stayed above 90%. So I really, it doesn't, it's not clear, I think, even to the medical professionals here, what they're looking at. I mean, a, a dip in antibodies, big a big dip in antibodies, but at least for for the the man made ones. But then 
the natural ones from getting and beating COVID are sticking around, but hospitalization is still sticking around. I don't, it doesn't say in the studies that I've read if they knew which one of those uh, people <clears throat> studying had received uh, or had gotten sick with COVID afterwards. Yeah. And along with the, along with the vaccine, I, I think at the end we're looking at still a lot of questions, but potentially looking at getting booster shots closer than most, like most others, you know, hep, what is it? Hep B, hep C, uh, and there's other ones that you get those vaccinations and it's like, you need to have them updated every so many years. This is probably the closest booster vaccine that we've seen from getting your original shots. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not 100% sure about this part where I think you and I have talked about COVID and it's all just like, oh, I just don't even want to look at it. What I do know that though is that as far as I know, I'm trying to remember, I want to say it's the FDA that was like, we don't need boosters. And the Biden administration was like pushing for yes, boosters. Yes, it was the Biden administration that pushed for it. And the CDC hadn't recommended it yet. And I don't think the, the WHO had recommended it either. They were getting ready to recommend it for uh, the elderly population. Yeah. Um, Which, but, I mean, again, that makes sense to me. But I am really hesitant about boosters. I'm not really sure... Like, again, you know my position. Like, I care if there's high hospitalization and high death. Mm -hmm. So if you get the vaccine, and even if you do catch it, you're not you're not getting, you know, you're not getting um, deathly sick. Fine. That's good. Great. Mm -hmm. That's all I care about. That's it. Yep. That's, I don't know. I, I, I do. think these things just tell us that we still don't fully know what we are dealing with. And that makes, it makes me hesitant to, to make, uh, changes to make decisions that can't be reversed. Yeah. Um, which is for me personally, part of my hesitancy when it comes to uh, the vaccine is like, okay, I'm not in a high risk category. I'm in a fairly low risk category for effects from COVID. And it seems to be the case for the vaccine as well. That being said, we just don't know. And there's a part of me that looks at it and goes, all right, I, I may or may not get COVID. I might have already had it, and I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, the most sick that I got in the last year and a half, two years was a sore throat. And that's what I'm sitting at at this point. So I don't, I don't understand it. Um, but I feel like for me, going and getting the vaccine is like, okay, definitely doing this medical procedure. I can't reverse it. COVID may or may not happen to me. I imagine it will at some point because it seems like it, it. nobody's particularly immune from it. Um, but it's just part of the, the mental struggle that I go back and forth with um, on top of some of the religious aspects with it. Yeah, and um, you have to, and you have to, uh, you have to make your own choice and decide what's best for you and your wife mm -hmm. and, and then go from there. And yep, think, and talk with my doctors and see where they're at with it. Uh, and, and question, question my doctor too. like, make sure like, Hey, are you reading up on this? Like, I don't understand this study. Can you explain it to me? Yeah, I agree with you. I um, agree. and I'm going to, I've got another article here. Just a, just a quick one to run through. I think Jordan needs to go, uh, <laughs> I need to, I need to blow my she needs nose. To go blow her nose, but I've got an article here. Uh, so Fauci back, uh, I want to say in spring, uh, testified to Congress that, there wasn't a connection between the uh, the NIH and the funding of gain of function research uh, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is in the same city where COVID broke out. And I really I, I want to get off of COVID because there's other things that I think are important uh, to discuss. And We've been talking about COVID for an hour. <laughs> that too. Um, but real quick here, um, I think Tim Cast has probably the best uh, summary for this, but. This uh, report came out on October 21st, and Charlie Mills is the author of this one. Uh, documents released yesterday by the National Institutes of Health, NIH, appear to confirm that Dr. Anthony Fauci lied earlier this year when he claimed the U.S. funded gain-of-function research for bat coronavirus at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. In a letter to Representative James Comer on Wednesday, a top NIH official blamed EcoHealth Alliance, a U.S. based based health organization that has used federal money for fund research at the WIV for failing to be transparent about the research that transpired there. NIH's principal deputy director, 
uh, Lawrence A. Tabak, wrote in a letter that EcoHealth's limited experiment uh, tested whether spike proteins from naturally occurring bat coronaviruses circulating in China were capable of binding to the human ACE2 receptor in a mouse model. The research plan was reviewed by NIH in advance of funding, and NIH determined that it did not fit the definition of research involving enhanced pathogens of, an, of pandemic potential because these bat coronaviruses had not been shown to infect humans. As such, the research was not subject to departmental review under the HHS uh, something framework. Um, but effectively here, they're finding that, no, they, they did fund it. Um, but they're saying that essentially they didn't know if it was that it was re it wasn't really gain of function because this is thought to have been so far removed from being able to jump to humans that it's not a risk. It, yeah, I mean, oh. It That's just, but I think the bigger story here is that Fauci did lie. Oh yeah, he told to me. Congress. Yeah, he lied for sure, and not really. Yeah, that's how uh, that's about that. as far as I want to go with it. That's about it. That for story me. is still developing. Uh, let it uh, let it continue. Uh, let it continue to go there. Uh, yeah, he he's argued in the past that gain of function research is worth it. And I think this is where science goes too far and they don't ask if they should do something um, and then they do it. But essentially, just for those who are not uh, aware of it and you want something to look up, uh, gain of function research is essentially enhancing something like a pathogen or a virus to make it more transmissible and more deadly to help better prepare vaccinations and help people basically help the medical professionals and the scientists to figure out how they're going to deal with this thing. But they're making it more deadly before they do that. And in this case, we might very well have been looking at a, a leak of one of those experiments that got out into the public. And now we're dealing with all of this today. And I am done talking about it. <laughs> and that's that. Um, yeah, actually, turn your mic just a little bit towards you. I feel like it, it, feels like it went away. Yeah, roll, roll the microphone. Roll yep, I'm going to come mute yours. <laughs> Jordan's making some mic uh, adjustments there. That's what I get for having to blow my nose. Is that closer now? Yeah, let me come over there and get that. I just want to fix this real quick. Um, but Jordan, we we've had it, we've been uploading our work to to Spotify and uh, and YouTube, and we had a little little instance with YouTube this last week. Yeah, I uh, I I think we have. I think we have. Um, so we ended up, well, actually, I'm going to let Connor fix my mic first. I'm sorry, guys. I had to, oh, that's so much better. That is so much better. I'm sorry, guys. I had to get up and blow my nose. I just couldn't, and I couldn't anymore. So oh, I, right. I, I went up and blew my nose. Um, but yeah, basically, I think a couple podcasts ago, we ended up talking about how there was a whistleblower for Pfizer, uh, Melissa Strickler, that basically talked about how uh, Pfizer vaccine was tested with fetal cells. Mm -hmm. And we made it very clear, and I believe by we, I mean Connor was very clear in that podcast that fetal cells are not in the vaccine, as far as we know, uh, but they were used to test the vaccine. And YouTube, and we made this into a clip, so it was just an isolated clip of just Connor talking about that. Pretty much, yep. And YouTube decided that this was misinformation. They did, and they and they took the video uh, off. So, I I think it was Monday morning. I, I got on uh, my computer and found that there, they had placed a warning on the channel saying that our content was removed due to a violation of the uh, community guidelines. Um, and you know they were like, "It's not a strike because this is the first time that you know this has happened." But anything else is going to be a strike on your channel, and you get too many strikes, and then your channel gets taken off of YouTube. Um, I was like, no, I watched this clip. Uh, I was very specific to state that it w that they were not in there. And in yeah, fact, I it was it there was a clarifying question from from you on that, and mm -hmm. definitely clarified it. Well, I was lucky enough that you know we were adamant about how that worked and submitted a response. I could only submit up to eight hundred characters, which is not a lot of room. Um, but I explained that the clip 
stated exactly the opposite, that it wasn't for that. And that's the other thing about this uh, community guideline strike that we got is it doesn't tell you exactly which community guideline you violated. It kind of gave me a category, which was medical misinformation. Um, but then I got into like all their medical misinformation pages and it is a long list of things that you cannot we talk about. We are not going to go through them today. I am not, but I did figure that the one that it most likely, I want to see if I can find it. Um, let's see. It, it's going to, it's going to be prevention misinformation or actually it might be uh, vaccine information. Let's see here. I'll find this real quick. Thank God for control. Fine. Um, but I, the one that I'm guessing it was, um, was uh, claiming that an approved COVID-19 vaccine will contain substances that are not the vaccine ingredient list, such as biological matter from uh, fetus, fetal tissue, fetal cell lines, or animal products. And we were very clear in that podcast that the fetal cell lines were used in the testing phase uh, for Pfizer and Moderna. We were actually a little bit uncertain of how it worked with Johnson & Johnson, although Johnson & Johnson, I can confirm, does use it in production. However, it still is not in the vaccine. It does not exist in there. Um, all that to be said, I was able to submit an appeal, and we were cleared on that video. So it is back up. So a little bit of a, a win for us. I was pretty happy about it. Yeah, I was a little um, surprised. I was, I was surprised, too. I wasn't sure I was going to go, but they sent back in a message saying, appeal granted. Thank you for your appeal. We've determined that your content, uh, News Corner Clips, what Pfizer didn't want you to know, doesn't violate uh, our community guidelines. And basically, they told me that the content had been uh, reinstated on our site. Funny enough, though, it was at 17 views when they had appealed it. And now it's like at 14 as of this morning. So I don't quite yeah, understand that one. It's kind of weird. Um, but I think it brings up a bigger topic of online censorship and misinformation stuff that I just, I, I don't know how that's supposed to be tackled or if it should even be tackled at all. And I wanted to see what your thoughts are on this because I, I don't know how much, uh, I know you I know you uh, listen to The Daily Wire and Ben Shapiro a lot. I know he's harped on it before about how it works because they've had their own run-ins with YouTube and uh, Twitter and stuff. But where where do you feel that this type of, misinformation censorship hate speech censorship or any of the the similar categories how does that work uh does that work for or against the public do you think um i'm i'm honestly not i'm not 100 my brain is starting to fry itself right now um i i know i'm trying to think this through my brain is frying <laughs> at this very <laughs> moment. Um, I shot two weddings in a row <laughs> uh, this that's, weekend. That's fair. Um, and I, I, may, I might have used all my brain power because um, I think you're referring specifically to Section 230 uh, a little bit with that. But also, that's, uh, that's that's part of where some of this comes into. But I mean, we we've messed. I mean, we mentioned a little bit before with with Twitter kicking people off, like the Hunter Biden story, and I think they they kicked off Nicki Minaj uh, for a little while. And it's just. What is too far? When, I mean, how how is this not violation of freedom freedom of speech? And you know, in the case of something like the Hunter Biden story, they hundred percent got that wrong. They deemed it misinformation. Facebook blocked it. Twitter blocked it. Took down New York Post's uh, Twitter profile. Uh, didn't reinstate it for a while. Uh, actually, I don't know if it ever got reinstated at this point. Um, they, they should have after it came out that the story was true and the FBI was doing the probe. But I think this is, I, I see, th I see the intent and I understand they're like, we don't want to, we don't want lies to be out there floating on the internet because it, people can get hurt from it. And, and we've seen that happen before. I don't think that's their intent. It, it I'm doesn't, being honest, it, I, that's not their intent. Their that, intent I, is to control Maybe the, the intent narrative. of people like you and me that are on the other side of the aisle, though. I've met them, I've talked to them, and they think medical, they think mis misinformation is a dangerous thing. And they could mean dangerous in a couple different ways. It depends on what they consider to be misinformation. If it's an opinion that you don't like, or if it's a fact that you don't like, I think Ali uh, Beth Stuckey, um, she does the podcast Relatable, mm -hmm. got kicked off of Twitter for saying that uh, men are not women. Right. Okay. So yes, the, my short answer to this again, my brain is kind of fried. I am getting there. Um, <laughs> um, it has gone too far because we've talked just a little bit. I want to say just about about control and taking away 
uh, the American, the true American way of life, not the way that America is now. You should have the freedom to be able to talk about those things and the things that they're considering to be misinformation, they've been completely wrong about, Mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of taken away the trust that they actually know what they're talking about as well whoever they is the people who ever fact checked our video clearly didn't listen to it yeah like, it wasn't these, even a long video right um and so i mean i think there are far-reaching consequences to this um i think we're gonna start to see more of it eventually and we'll probably end up getting into some deeper discussions about what social media looks like mm-hmm. a little bit more about section 230 and what's going on there um i have listen to another audiobook uh, about about section 230 and some of the things that go on with that um and that's something i think we should i think that's the one that at some point yeah i think that's the the publisher versus uh platform yes um I, yes ben shapiro he has a book called the authoritarian moment mm-hmm. and he has i believe it's like a chapter or a section that kind of goes through a little bit of what Chapter 230 can do and how things kind of shifted and changed uh, through the timeline. Um, it's, a, it's a good book. Uh, I'd suggest uh, people read it if you want a different perspective on on how the, how they see the left, how how people who are more conservative uh, tend to view what the left is doing if you, if you want to read it. Yeah, and, and I don't remember everything about that, but I want to say it has to do with like a, a type of liability. of Yes, you know, it has whether, to do with liability. Whether the companies are liable for what happens on their platform. And by and large, at least, at least initially, I want to say no, they're not. Um, yeah, they're... But I know that that can get kind of into a really trippy, tricky uh, topic. Yeah, um, it does. Definitely, it does get into a tricky, definitely one worth, tricky topic. Yeah, definitely one worth looking at more in the future. Um, hopefully we can uh, continue to avoid uh, strikes on YouTube. I am looking for alternate video sources uh, that are a little bit more accommodating to free speech. And, um, you know, if we make a mistake, we've said it on here multiple times, if we make a mistake, we will come back and correct it. Like me with my... Um with my uh, countries. Slavery for slavery would've... ended first in America. Dude, I would have sworn that's exactly what I'd heard. I was like, oh, that's really cool. We did. And I was like, no, we, we did. I was like, never mind. Yeah. That was, uh, that no, was they, I feel like, I I feel like they tend point. to leave that one out of the history books. They're just like, yeah, we abolished it hint, or we abolished it you know, on the state. And they don't really talk about what happened in other countries. So yeah. world history is important, guys. Um, Clearly for me. Clearly for me. I'm. I don't remember what project it was that I worked on that I happened to run across that, but it definitely stuck with me because be, prior to that, I was of the same mindset that America was the first one, and we were not. We were one of the last. But it was all within just about the same year as the other ones, so that's fun, right? <laughs> we're close. We we made it happen in the end. We made it happen. The point is that, that matters. I I think the bottom line is that America itself has progressed and became a really awesome country for a lot of people and it still is for a lot of people and then we have a lot of people here that uh that live here and hate it and speak vile in and vitriol towards it um again that same irony and i just the that that's part of the culture stuff that we definitely want to tackle and uh talk about and maybe someday we can even interview somebody that's of that mindset and see where they're coming from yeah, one day. But one until day. then, next week we have a special episode of Book Club. Uh, we're going to be going through Animal Farm, and again, we'll talk more about culture and what America looks like now, If how we're moving in that direction. Animal Farm, so far, mm-hmm. is good. Um, and I've been enjoying it, so we will, we'll, I guess we'll just meet you there, and we'll, and we'll talk about it then. Absolutely. And I think that's all I have to say. What about you, Connor? Nope, I'm good as well. Uh, any other project updates that we're working on, they're still in progress and coming soon. You'll see them announced on our social media pages. Um, but if you guys have questions or comments, I think the best place probably is going to be on our YouTube clips. Um, so you can find the full episodes there, and then you can find the individual clips taken out of the full episodes. But if you guys want to interact with us, that is probably the best place to ask questions and comment as far as video content is concerned. So what happened in a certain podcast that'll help us identify where it's coming from, um, what your questions regarding. Um, but then also we have our Instagram and Facebook pages as well, uh, which you can find us at Resident Skeptics on Instagram and Facebook. Very good. Very good, Connor. You got it. <laughs>
All right. Other than that, I think I'm ready to crank the AC and, uh, and get out of this room. <laughs> uh, you can do that. All I'm right. going to drink my, my latte. You do that. We will catch you guys next week for the book review.